It's like he knew that I was prone to forgetting to record <laughs> when I teach. <laughs> so now that we're recording again, I'm not going to do another introduction. Uh, we're just going to dive right in. So today is meant to talk about agreements in real estate. And when I say agreements, there are typically four different parties to a real estate transaction. A buyer, the seller, the buyer's representative in their agency, and the seller representative in their agency. We're going to talk about the different ways that there's agreements made between these parties. The first one that I want to talk about is the buyer brokerage agreement. Now, if you remember back to your licensing days, the agreement is between just that. It's the brokerage and the buyer. In this case, it is Keller Williams, Richmond West, and that client. It is not the individual agent. Now, the brokerage then assigns the agent. That's why you're signing this buyer agreement. But I want you to remember that in all parties here, buyer and the brokerage are the partners in this case. Okay, so this agreement is made as of, we're gonna walk through these paragraphs together. Most of you should have a copy in front of you. Those of you that are on Zoom, if you do not have a copy of it, uh, please let me know in the chat or drop your email in there. Sorry for those of you that walked in afterwards. Come grab one of each of these up front. And they should be stapled, so you should be able to just grab it. We're on the easy one pager first. This is the short form. There is a long form in there. Uh, the short form has been more practiced in CVR in our region since probably about 2019 when this thing was updated. It has everything you need on here. Um, so use this one. So the very beginning of it is pretty obvious. It's talking about the date that the agreement is made. Jason, I know, I know who you are and I have your email, but if you don't mind, will you just sign in and then grab one of each of these? We're on the buyer brokerage agreement first, and the first paragraph is talking about the date. Now, this agreement is made as of. This is the date that you start working together. Now, fun fact for the audience, when is it considered a client, or when should you disclose that you are licensed in real estate? Just by show of hands, you can answer. Immediately. Immediately, yeah. Upon a substantial conversation about real estate. So if you are having a conversation with somebody and they express an interest in buying a house, does that mean you have to shove this piece of paper in front of them and sign it right away? No, but this piece of paper should become part of the conversation shortly thereafter you have disclosed that you are a licensed realtor. Because what this piece of paper is going to do is express what your duties are as their agent or as their representative. And that's extremely important because right now there are a lot of, uh, I don't want to say misrepresentations out there, but there's a lot of ways where you can be performing what would be considered a duty of an agent and not necessarily be under agreement to do so. We'll talk about more. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. So if you read this first paragraph, and I'm not going to go line by line today, so don't fear that, but we are going to kind of highlight the major pieces. However, one thing that I do want to express to everybody, both online and in the room, is to find a mentor and or a broker in your office or in this office that you can review contracts and paperwork with often. If you're on a team, that's oftentimes your team leader or maybe even a contract coordinator or something like that. Uh, if you're not on a team and you're in productivity coaching, it's more often than not going to be Patrice. And if you're one of the lucky few in between, you will have other resources provided to you by hopefully your brokerage. And if you're here, you definitely do here. But review these documents often. It's very, it's very seldom that the language is changed that's gonna have a significant impact. And if that's gonna occur, you're gonna hear it from the top down. But it is good to stay familiar with these types of things, such as the buyer brokerage agreement moving to one page. That happened a couple of years ago, and so more and more people are starting to use this document. First paragraph says, in consideration of this mutual agreement, everybody's on the same page, I am your agent, and you are my buyer, and I'm going to represent you to buy a house. Yeah, you can sign that and grab one of each. In the acquisition of real property, as used here in acquisition of real property includes any purchase, option, or exchange of real property or agreement to do so. Now, an optional section here, and this is something that you can talk about with your coach, team leader, productivity coach, or mentor, is you can sign these for a specific property or a specific type of property. So if you're meeting somebody for the first time and you're showing them a house, maybe they're from an internet lead or something like that, it is okay, and in fact, it's in your best interest to sign one of these agreements and put the specific address to that property here. 
that is going to protect you as the agent, as well as the buyer, because you're disclosing that you're representing them for that property. And this is something you're going to, you're going to want to keep in mind before you show any house. So you hear this a lot of times from coaches, get a buyer brokerage agreement signed before you step foot in the property. You can sign a specific address. Now, let's say you've established a good relationship with somebody and you're going to work with them as a buyer here on out. And in this market, that may take more than just one property. You can put single family home or town home or land or all of the above on here. Questions on that? Can, can I just add one thing? Yes, please. And I would do, you might do a kind of a broad area, but I know the courts have said, you know, even though you're allowed to, you're licensed in Virginia and allowed to sell anywhere in Virginia, they would like to see it a little more specific than that. So maybe, you know, residential property in the greater uh, yeah, Richmond metro yeah, area or whatever it is. So that's a great point too. Um, and that's especially important with some of our clients. I'm trying to look around the room and see if we had any examples lately. Um, we're seeing a lot of what I call MLS overlap, which to give you a real life example would be a buyer that lives here that wants to buy in Williamsburg. There's an MLS overlap there. So when you're having these MLS overlaps, our form, if you notice at the top, says CBR MLS exclusive right to represent a buyer agreement. That means it's provided by the Central Virginia Regional MLS, which is our area. That's what Rick is referring to. So you do want to make sure you are being specific and clear with your clients. Um, and if you are getting an agreement to represent somebody for a greater rich, greater than our area, meaning outside of our area, you want to make sure that's disclosed. And there are also Virginia Association of Realtor Docs that we can have a different conversation about. Should that be the case? This is going to be the one you're going to use most of the time. Uh, but the more specific you can be here, the better. Thank you. And also one other thing, and Austin was correct in saying that before you show the property, because a few years ago, the real estate board uh, provide, produced a white paper where they determined that showing a property is a licensed activity. So, um, and so, which means you're representing them. So it is advisable to get it before that point, not just what some agents do before they start writing an offer. Spot on, especially in this part, because yes. oftentimes, uh, oftentimes right now we're finding ourselves showing a property and whether you write an offer or not, our traditional way of thinking in this market is you write an offer and that you have a pretty legitimate chance of getting that accepted. For those buyers, <laughs> buyer agents in the room, that's not always the case right now. Uh, matter of fact, in 2021, it took on average four offers per buyer to get under contract. So if you're writing four offers for somebody for one single client, you're going to want to make sure your relationship with that client is disclosed and clear. And as well, you want to protect your own investment of time because now it's taking a little bit more time to get somebody under contract. Meaning you're having to work a little bit harder. So you want to make sure those uh, duties are dis disclosed and agreed upon. And that's exactly what section three is talking about. I sort of jumped over to two is the length of the agreement. Uh, Rick, do you have a preference here? Because I've heard differing things from six months to a year. It's really going to be negotiable with your client. Right. Um, so as far as, uh, and sometimes the property type dictates the length of the agreement. What I mean by that is if I'm working with somebody that's building a new house right now, I'm obviously going to need a longer buyer agreement because they're building a house versus if they're putting an offer in tomorrow and they're getting that house, the length of the agreement isn't necessarily as important. Um, but you do want to make sure there's still ample time there to find a house, close on the property, and make sure all parties are represented fairly. Now, broker's duties. Broker shall represent the buyer as a standard agent. That's what this agreement is referring to. In this brokerage relationship, and locate property available for purchase and suitable to buyer. Unless otherwise provided by law or buyer consents in writing to the release of this information or release of information, this is really important. Broker shall maintain the confidentiality of personal information, financial inf information, and any other matters identified as confidential by the buyer. Okay, so it is not appropriate to share how comfortable or how maxed your budget or your client's budget is. It is not necessarily appropriate to share why they're moving unless your client has given you express consent to do so such as they provided you a written letter to share with the seller that says here's what I'm doing. Any questions on that? 
sometimes that gets a little muddy water when we start talking pre-approval letters and that sort of thing. Um, a pre-approval letter is different than you sharing how much the buyer is willing to spend. Just be careful and be cautious of that. Yeah, uh, question. Never mind. I, th I thought I had a question. <laughs> no such thing as a bad question, just bad answers. Uh, if broker is not in the listing firm of the seller, broker shall represent solely the interest of the buyer in all negotiations and transactions regarding the acquisition of real property. I'm going to highlight to get this again later because we're going to talk about it a lot, especially when it comes to representing sellers and the purchase agreement. Uh, a big conversation point that Rick and I have had on our calls recently is the code of ethics and how that relationship is prioritized. And what that means is you have a duty to represent your client's best interest first. And so right now there are a lot of houses that are selling what I call double ended, which is two agents from the same company or same team are working both sides. That is considered designated agency. That is not dual agency. This part here is referring to something that could be either one, uh, but you want to make sure those disclosures are met as well. And so designated agency for a reminder is if it's two agents, same brokerage, but differing parties, differing people, one's representing seller, one representing buyer, or one representing landlord, or one representing tenant. And then there's also a dual agency, which is where the same agent is representing both sides. This paragraph here is expressively saying, unless that document is signed, the buyer in this case is protected by the broker and their best interest. Does that make sense everybody? All right, buyer's duties is paragraph four. Buyer shall work exclusively with broker during the term of this agreement. Remember, we talked about it before. This agreement is with the brokerage. Unfortunately, this does occur, but sometimes things happen and a buyer may be upset with an agent or not want to work with that agent anymore. The agreement is with the brokerage. And what oftentimes happens is a broker, the supervising broker or the principal broker would step in and reassign that agent or that client to a different agent because we want to preserve that relationship with the brokerage because that's how the agreement was agreed upon. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Compensation, couple options here. As you can see, this one is a pre-filled in document because we are typically selecting option B, which is broker shall be paid a fee equal to the compensation offered by a listing firm or seller to a buyer's brokerage on property acquired. Sorry, the formatting got a little funky here. Um, Option A is going to allow you to be a little bit more specific as far as the compensation is concerned. Rick, do you have advice or anything you want to chime in on here? Um, the only thing I, I'm glad that, well, I will say CVR has done a better job because they've actually got that option available to you all. Other places where I broker and teach, they don't have that, uh, where, where the option is what's offered in the MLS or by the seller. Um, I do just want to point out that what's offered in the MLS is offered by the listing company, not the seller. So, um, but this one kind of covers both, but just so agents do know in the MLS, you're, it's offered from the listing company, not the seller. So. Exactly right. And one of the things we're going to talk about, so to give you a little bit of foreshadowing here, first thing we're talking about is the relationship between the buyer and the brokerage. And that's because right now there's a lot more buyers in this market. The next thing we're gonna talk about is the listing agreement, which is the seller and the brokerage. And the third thing we're gonna talk about is actually gonna be briefly be the MLS. And that's because the MLS is the agreement between the buyer representation or the buying brokerage and the listing representation of the listing agent, listing brokerage, which is exactly what Rick is talking about. So that MLS is, ex is, is expected to be the agreement between the two parties, the two parties representation in this case. Now, the unique piece there is if you are checking option B, broker shall be paid fee equal to compensation offered by the listing firm. And we know that the MLS is our agreement between parties. If we screenshot that MLS, and matter of fact, it has this, if you scroll down, it shows you exactly what that compensation should be. And that's a best practice tip. Matter of fact, if you're in our office, you have to submit that MLS or the tax record to get paid. So you might as well make it a habit of when you're getting this signed and when they're putting an offer on our house, Screenshot that MLS, screen grab, whatever terminology you use. Does that make sense? Or print it if you're a paper person. That MLS is your agreement between the buyer representation and the listing representation. 
Now the fee shall be due during the term of this agreement. This is your what I call your protection period at the end. As you can see, I have 90 days written. You can't see because the things are canceled. So we have 90 days written in here. This can be again negotiated 30, 60, 90 days. Essentially, what this paragraph is talking about is if you are found to be the procuring cause for a purchase agreement, meaning you show a buyer a property, this agreement ends and then the buyer tries to enter into agreement to buy that property. It is expressly saying that the brokerage is then protected because they provided the duties which produced the sale. So this protection period is after this agreement ends. That's where that 90 days is. Now that is unless they enter into another agreement. Thank another you. agency agreement. I was just about to say another oh, agency agreement would, would what? No, it, it totally null and voids this, this agreement, correct? Correct. Yep. So a good, another best practice tip too, is if you are working with a buyer or if you meet a buyer, especially at something like an open house or something like that, it is always standard practice to ask if they've established, signed, or agreed upon a written agreement with any other agencies. Because if they have, obviously we just talked about what that entails. Can I give you a little tip on that one? What I've heard yes. from agents is they have found it better like at an open house, instead of asking, have you signed another buyer agency agreement or something like that is, what is the name of your buyer agent? I was just about to say too, on the sign-in sheets, for those of you that use those at open houses, we found much better response if we say, instead of saying, "Are do you have an agent, yes or no? We say, who's your agent? Yep. Oh, they'll write none if they don't have one, or they'll leave it blank. If they have one, they'll write down the name. So it's very similar to what, what Rick is talking about, is ask them, who's your agent? And a little culture tip too, I always follow that up by saying, I love the mastermind with good agents. Because we are, we're always looking for good agents, especially in this market on who we can work with and interact with and have success with, because that's what we want to be doing business with. Okay, any questions on the buyer brokerage agreement? The last little bit here is talking about e-signatures and how to sign. Um, it does seem a little bit confusing because it says broker and then it asks you to print or, or sign. That is your signature or your representation. The brokerage would still say Keller Williams. Actually, this is typed in here incorrectly. It should say Keller Williams Realty, Richmond West. So correct that on here, please. And then you would print your name and sign it. And then another little compliance tip, your date when you sign it should match the date when your buyer signs it. I don't want to see those dates not matched. Those dates. Don't match. Is there like a, a due wait time? Not necessarily. I mean, it's it's going to be more of a compliance question at that point. Um, typically, what I've seen in the past is when the when the dates don't match, it's more often because say the buyer signed it, and the agent signed it the next day, or vice versa. The agent signed it and then went met with the the buyer the next day. Um, as long as it's fairly close together or there's a reason for it, you should be fine. Um, but that's more to protect your your interest too. Uh, we don't want to see a buyer signature either much later or much after the eight or before the agent signature because that could be um, grounds for it. I, I think the biggest thing there is and it's is if you sign it later. So if you're signing it right then, you're probably going to provide them a copy. And if it's done electronically, they already get one. But if it is, you're sitting down with them and they sign and you sign, make a copy of it, give them a copy of it at that time. If you sign it later on, then make sure to email them a copy or something so that you've got proof that they were provided a copy. Because that's one thing that they try and get it. Well, I never got a copy of it. Yeah. And that's one of the problems. Delivery is part of ratification of an agreement. So, Very similar way of thinking about this would be if you put an offer in for a buyer, seller signs it, but you never saw the contract come back, how do you know you ever signed it? Right. Obviously an exaggerated form of that because it's the relationship between the buyer and the brokerage, but it's the same similar mindset. All right. Any other questions on the buyer brokerage form? All right. So next I want to jump into the listing agreement. So this one is a little bit longer. Not much longer. I'm going to play with the formatting over here. And Rick, while I have you. This does still need to be your name as the principal broker, correct? Correct, correct. Okay. Okay. But I have given the agents the authority to be able to sign on my behalf. Sure, 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 sure. So um, to, to kind of add a little bit of housekeeping stuff there, 
uh, Rick is still the principal broker. So that's why his name is typed in here. That's the firm broker's name. Uh, I, I intentionally left the firm name and address blank because we're going to write it together because those are things that you guys should always know because you have to put them on a lot of stuff. Um, and that doesn't always auto populate. Now, typically, if you're using transaction desk, it will. Um, but we just talked about it a second ago. The firm name is Keller Williams Realty, Richmond West. Not necessarily as important in our area because we only have two Keller Williams offices in our region, so to speak, but uh, or in our, our MLS. Um, but in our region, I mean, just in the Alliance group alone, there's multiple MLS or multiple Keller Williams. So it is always a good idea just to disclose which branch or which franchise you are specifically. The firm address is 6806 Paragon Place, P-A-R-A-G-O-N Place. We are Suite 300, Richmond, Virginia, 23230. Question. Yes. So I always put Rick and not Richard. Yeah. Rick? I, do I need to put Richard? In do you have a preference there? Does it matter? It doesn't matter to me. It shouldn't matter um, because his license is still him, obviously, and it's still the, the the big thing there is if there's ever a discrepancy or something needs to be brought to their attention, it's meant to be easy access of who's the brokerage in charge or who's the broker of record for Keller Williams. Okay. As we talk about the buyer brokerage agreement, this agreement, the listing agreement is between the seller and the brokerage. So in this case, it's the seller and Keller Williams Realty, Richmond West, which again is another reason why we wanna make sure we're specific and clear there. Um, that's where the same thing, if it's Richard or Rick, it's okay because they're gonna call him if need be. Okay, exclusive right to sell. This is an exclusive right to sell agreement, which for those of you that do not remember back from your licensing days, means if any seller or any buyer is produced to purchase this property, we are owed commission. So the seller can't say later, oh, I, I brought the buyer. Um, so we'll talk more about that later when we get to the compensation point, but it is an exclusive right to sell. It is not an exclusive agency agreement or something of the other different factors. The other side, the owner is exactly what it sounds like. The owner's name enter into this agreement on this date and it terminates on 11.59 on this date here. So this is where you would set the end of the listing agreement. For some reason, this is one of the most overlooked sections of the agreement and it surprises me because it's number one, but you would be surprised how many listing agreements I see come across the desk without this date. In there. Um, and it needs to be. Again, negotiable with the owner, probably profit, property specific, so make sure uh, you negotiate appropriately because this agreement should be for the length of settlement. So all the way through closing. And it can be extended upon everybody initially. So let's say you do it through June and you get to June and the house hasn't sold. You can extend it, but everybody has to agree to the extension. Can I bring one thing up about listing dates? Sometimes I will see agents and, and it's understandable that they do this the house needs work to be done to it before it goes in the MLS. And so, you know, the seller says, I'm going to get it done in, in two weeks. Of course, normally it takes them longer, but so some agents, you know, want to say, well, you know what, I want it for six months after it's put in the MLS. Unfortunately, the, in Virginia, to be a, a valid contract, you have to have a specified date up front. You need to be able to know what that specified expiration date is. So saying, um, we'll, you know, put it on our, the expiration is six months after it's put in the MLS. If you don't have a specific date, it's going to be put in the MLS, then that doesn't work. So, um, you know, what I would recommend if, if there's going to be work to done or something like a delay in putting it in really on the market, then go ahead and do it for six months. And then once it goes on the market, go back and, um, you know, do an amendment or whatever and change it and extend it some. Um, but, or you could say that it's going to be put in the MLS in 30 days, then it'll be six months after that. Uh, that is fine because you can see the specific date. The only thing I'll add to that one is if you are going to delay, maybe I also now may be stealing your thunder here. Um, if you are going to delay and put it again, putting it in the MLS, you've got to get another document signed 
Um, and I can't remember the exact name of it. Um, but it's, it's basically one that the, the seller is waiving their right to put it in the MLS, you know, at this point, and that has to be turned in. Yeah, so uh, the form that he's referring to is called the owner opt-out form. I wish I had this CBR number memorized. I do not. If you go in transaction desk and look under listing agreements, it's in there. Um, it's another one pager. We will probably talk about this in the coming weeks, either in a broker moment on a Tuesday meetings or at the next contracts class, because it is becoming more prevalent. Um, so to back step a little bit, and we're not going to go over that one or coming soon today, but those are two addendums or amendments that are added to the listing agreement. So if you're going to put a listing in coming soon, CBR MLS says the max for, for coming soon is three weeks. Meaning from the time you sign this agreement and the coming soon agreement, you have three weeks until it goes in the MLS. Matter of fact, it's going to be automatic to go active in the MLS. So if you need longer than three weeks, which is kind of how we started this, this trail of thoughts with Rick, was maybe they're having worked on or something like that, that's when you would default to the owner opt-out form. The owner opt-out form formerly was called office exclusive listings. You may have heard these called secret listings or pocket listings, which are frowned upon terms, so don't call them that. <laughs> <laughs> but it is an office exclusive listing and more appropriately named uh, owner opt-out because they're not putting it in the MLS until a disclosed later date. And it's oftentimes to prep the property for sale. And, and the big one about that is if you use the owner opt-out form, then you are not allowed to publicly market the property. Exactly. And you also cannot put a sign in the yard. That is considered public advertising. Same thing with a coming soon sign. If you put that in the yard, that triggers that three weeks count. So as soon as you put a coming soon sign in the yard, three weeks starts. That makes sense? And if you do publicly advertise, regardless of what form you sign, or don't sign. It has to be in the MLS within 24 hours. So we have had this happen, real life story. Uh, we had an owner opt-out form signed. It was supposed to be for, I think, a month, 30 days. Sound was ringing a bell in my ear. And then we had a three-week coming soon period, and then it was to go, supposed to go on the market. Well, we had a signed delivery person put the sign in the yard two weeks early. And so we had to immediately go to coming soon and immediately put it on the market. What we ended up actually doing was temporarily withdrawing it, but it's because <laughs> of what happened. So don't do that. Be careful of your dates here and make sure you're disclosing those to your, your sellers too, because that is a curated timeline for a seller that is really impactful right now. Because it allows you to say, I want you to help sell my house at a price and terms we agree to, which we're going to talk about here as we go through this document. And the owner opt-out form, as well as the coming soon agreement, are meant to buy the seller more time to prep their house for sale. But the owner opt-out form also allows them to buy them more time until they get where they're going, whether that is to find something. That's why a lot of people are doing office exclusives right now. We have a couple on our team. Or maybe they're building. That's another common one. So I have a client that's under contract. They're building. So they said, if we can get this number now, we would sell sooner and just do a later close date. And then as we get closer to their move out time, we will put it in the MLS. And, and you all are lucky in Richmond because the fine if it, it's just a, kind of a normal fine, uh, if you're just a warning, if you're going to sell up in the Northern Virginia area, because I know some agents have bright MLS also, the fine is an immediate $5,000 if you oh, are wow. publicly marketing and it's not in the MLS. Ours is no, so <laughs> not nearly as, as much skin in the game, but it is immediate and you cannot withdraw it. So once it hits, because a lot of that stuff is automated. So yeah. come soon, that sort of thing, it is automated. Um, road to the rules is what CBR calls, uh, I think that's what it's called, right? Road to the rules. You're nodding, yes. I think it's, a, I've taken a few of them, but that'll get you what they call a get out of jail free card um, if you take the class. But it's also a good one to take because that's when they go over some of these new documents that are coming. So um, when you log in MLS, they'll have something pop up. It'll say road to rules course. Can't remember if they're still on Zoom or if they're in person or both, but um, keep an eye out for those. Always a good thing to keep in mind. All right, so the next little section here is talking about the actual property. Um, this should auto populate depending on where you're filling out your contracts. If you're still old school like I am and you want to write it in hand, you can. Uh, that can all the stuff information can be found in the tax record. The sales price of the property is to be this, which price includes selling compensation and the terms and conditions of the sale are as follows. This is where anything else would be put in there. If there's any sort of bonus language. Um, if there's any sort of 
extended possession, you want to put in here, you can. Rick, do you want to add anything to the pricing? That's pretty simple. I think that's good. Just that it does have to have a price. I do see some agents are putting <laughs> should be determined, you know, especially if it's they're going to be off the market for a little bit before it goes really on the market, you would need to amend it and have, you know, initials for what it's actually being put on the market for. And that's a really good point based on what we were just talking about, because sometimes what happens is, and this is actually a real life scenario as well, you sign one of these other opt out forms or maybe even a coming soon listing. And before the house is gone on the market, another comparable sale sells in the house or in the neighborhood for $50,000 more. Well, now your seller's looking at it going, well, can I get more money for my house? And so sometimes this list price does go up before it hits on the market um, or down. Sometimes your, your phone doesn't ring at all like you thought it would. It may be able to lower the price before it hits the market. That's why it's important to put a list price here, agree to that up front, but explain to your sellers this number can change really at any time, but to be most beneficial to them, it can change at any time before you hit the market. And when I say hit the market, it means it's active in the MLS. Now, even when it's coming soon in the MLS, if you do do a price change up or down, it will reflect that, but it's not going to be as impactful as far as like marketing is concerned until it's active in the MLS. For those of you that are familiar with the MLS and the home screen, the way it looks, the little hot box button there and the um, most people, it's in the center. Mine's kind of towards the top because I've moved it. Uh, there's, there's tabs there, new listings, back on market, price increase, price decrease. It's putting your listing in a different category. That's repopulating it. Multiple listing service, kind of just jump to this. Uh, number four is disclosing that the owner is aware that as a CVR MLS member, we are required to put these in the MLS. This, these listings, that's exactly what we just talked about. Compensation section five. I want you to put a little asterisk next to this, mainly because this is the number one question that I get asked when I am going through listing agreements, and I've done a lot of these. The first section, is talking about the total compensation paid. So owner agrees to pay to broker the compensation total is going to be oftentimes 6%. Again, this is negotiable. The second part, um, and, and so sorry, the formatting is a little funky here, but this is where you would typically put in your gross percentage here. And if there's some sort of sum or a fee or transaction fee or admin fee or something like that, you would put that in there in the next blank long line. The fee shall be paid in cash at settlement or such other time as set forth in this agreement. The settlement attorney is going to take care of that. What kind of language would you put on that blank line for them to take a trans get transaction fee? It would be something to the effect of the sum of give the exact amount and then say paid to. Cal Williams, Rich and West, as an administrative fee or as a transaction coordination. And I just give one warning, it's kind of the just right up above that. If you're just going to go with a percentage, make sure that amount is it's both it's the total commission. There are still I, every once in a while I, I still come across it, even from experienced agents. I just had one last week where an experienced agent put in three percent. And then they were giving away 3%. So in essence, they were working for zero. Exactly. So. And I, I have one of those right now, but it's because it's my house. So I'm not paying the listing agent any commission. So it made sense for 3% to be the first one. Uh, but at the same time, that's a very good point. I explain this to the sellers in that exact language by saying, hey, this first paragraph, this first percentage is your total commission. The second percentage that we're going to offer next is the cooperating side. It's what we're paying the buyer representation. Out of that first part, yep. Out of that first part. And the reason why I had you start this is because nine times out of 10, I write six in the first one, three in the second one, and the seller goes, whoa, 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 I didn't agree to 9%. Mm -hmm. so, me neither, but if you're offering, we can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, so, so make sure, and it says it here, but again, it is fine print. Broker's firm policy regarding cooperating with and compensating other real estate licensees from the compensation set forth above. So think six and three um, or total commission and then what you're paying the buyer side. Best practices tip, make it 50% or more. If you're willing to list from us, that's fine. But don't take it out of the buyer side. 
questions, concerns. There's also a sum of administrative fee, um, or if you're going to do like a flat fee, that's not an administrative fee, excuse me, if you're going to do a flat compensation amount or a flat fee, uh, oftentimes you might see some builders do this and then say $2,500, um, something like that. If it's just a standard flat fee commission, um, that's where that would go. And it would be, and notice how it says or, doesn't say and. All right, scroll down a little bit further. Section six, this is what we talked about briefly earlier. Dual and designated agency. You do want the seller to consent to these. So they're consenting to dual agency and consenting to, to designated agency. Now this paragraph does not relinquish your responsibility to get one of those addendums signed. This is just getting the permission again. Remember this agreement is between the seller and the listing brokerage. This is the listing brokerage saying, hey, are you okay if I bring a buyer or if my company has a buyer's agent that brings a buyer to buy this house? That's what both of these boxes are saying. If you're a new agent, I would recommend maybe trying to avoid dual agency. I have done one dual agency deal in almost 13 years in real estate, and it was a family member. So it does not have to be done. Matter of fact, it shouldn't be done because it makes it very hard for you to represent one party fairly to the other party because very often times you've known one longer or you're help, you've been helping one longer or maybe you have a little bit more emotional connection to one or a, or a better connection with one so it, 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 it creates a gray area that shouldn't be there it's very easy to partner especially in our brokerage and our culture of sharing to partner with somebody else to represent the other side yes and you can still get that 25 percent referral fee correct thank you yes you can and that can be negotiated with that other agent we do that all the time on my team where I'll have a listing, a buyer will call in. I don't want to represent both sides. So a buyer agent on my team will work with them. And it's a team lead in that case. So the team gets paid a piece. It's essentially the same thing. You are a part of a bigger team at Keller Williams. You're a part of an office wide team. Part of why culture is written on the wall everywhere because we are happy to share and help with each other. And it doesn't always have to be a referral fee too. It can also be like a, hey, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. If you have a couple of agents that do similar volume, partner up with each other. It's best practice. Thank you for saying that, Rick, because I meant to as well. Um, property Owners Association and Condominium, this is disclosing. If it's in a nature way, you have to have, obviously disclose that. It means it's, un, it's protected under the Virginia Property Owners Association Act. So if it is in a nature way, you want to recognize that. And you want to go ahead and get permission from the owner to uh, order the disclosure packet. Again, that's kind of best practices again, but you're gonna to wanna to do that. If they have a contact for the HOA, it doesn't hurt to get that, it may make your job easier. Same thing with a condo. If it is a condo, you wanna disclose that it is that, and you wanna have them authorized to order the resale certificate. Now we will talk about this more when we get to the purchase agreement on what these two things mean, but you do wanna make sure that's disclosed. Austin, do you have any trouble down in Richmond with there, there are some associations that will not, you have to have a buyer's name for them to send one. Do you have that problem there? Yes and no. The biggest problem we have is, if I had to guess, there's about 40 to 50% of the homeowners associations are all represented by, uh, there's a company called HomeWise, um, which is basically a third party site that you can order resale documents from. And it's all one stop shop and they'll, they'll handle it for you. They do ask for the buyer's information. I don't think it's necessarily as compliant as like if you put in Mr. and Mrs. Jones, I think they still take it. Um, but but yeah, you do still, they still ask for all that information. If it's not on home laws and you have to actually go to the HOA, it's kind of case by case. So I've seen some that require it. I've seen some that don't, um, but they do always require the buyer's representation, the agent. All right, so next section number nine. Yes, question. question. Sorry, I skipped over again. No worries. For the dual and designated, did you say there's an additional addendum? Is yeah. it for both or just one? There's an additional addendum for both. And the reason why it's separate from this agreement is because once you enter into a purchase agreement or you make an offer, that's when one of these is going to need to be disclosed. So, real life example I have a listing right now. Brianna Walker, who's an agent on my team, is representing the buyer. I'm representing the seller. That is designated agency. She submitted the purchase agreement of the offer before my seller even signed. We had a designated agency agreement included. 
that said Keller Williams, Rich and West represents both buyer and seller in this contract. Brianna Walker is assigned to the buyer, Austin Heifel is assigned to the seller. The dual agency form is a separate form that says essentially the same thing, but it would say Austin represents both parties. And it's a little bit more clear language as far as I'm basically a paper pusher at that point. Uh, yeah. Um, if you have any trouble finding those, they're in the MLS uh, Instanet transaction desk. I think we also have them up on our portal now. If not, I'll get them up there because especially designated agency, that's, that's one that needs to be disclosed. Uh, well, actually, both of them need to be disclosed right away. Okay, never mind. This is disclosing how we're going to advertise on the internet. Unless you've been living under a rock for the last uh, 30 years. Internet's important to selling houses. So uh, we want to make sure we're getting that authorization there. If for whatever reason the owner wants to opt out of the internet and not have their property uh, advertised on there, they would need to initial option A or B. That little box there. So the format is kind of weird. And then if they are going to authorize you to advertise on the internet, which they should, you're going to initial both of these first blanks. If they are not, you're going to initial both second blanks. Now, quick point here, another compliance housekeeping item. If there are two sellers or two owners of the property or multiple owners of the property, more than one, every one of them needs to initial the spot. So if it's a husband and wife, you can't just have one initial spot. Notwithstanding the above instructions that will be associated with the owner's MLS property listing, et cetera, um, this is just a disclosure that was, I think it was added more recently. It's essentially saying we are not responsible as the brokerage for how third party sites share the information. Now we are responsible for what information goes in MLS. Um, and that's kind of what the next section is talking about, the use of listing content. But this is, excuse me, giving the, the seller is giving the brokerage permission to describe the property and talk about such property in order to produce the sale. Rick, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think. Pretty, pretty <laughs> self-explanatory here. There's not a lot you really need to worry about here. Um, the owner does irrevocably assign or transfer the broker all copyright rights. You do want to have that does box check. I know it's kind of hard to see here. Um, I'm mousing it. Um, that's again going to allow you to advertise on the internet. It's also going to allow you to type what you need to type into the MLS. Lockbox section 11, pretty self-explanatory there, asking to put a lockbox on the house. If they don't want a lockbox for whatever reason, or sometimes they have uh, a code, combo code to unlock the door and they just want to give you a code. Best practice tip there, get the code, write down on a piece of paper, put it in a century lockbox. The century lock is a requirement of our MLS. And matter of fact, should be best practices and used. It's a security setting for you just as much as it is the seller because it keeps a ready log of who accessed the property and when. Owner does or does not authorize a termite inspector to use lockbox key. Again, negotiable if you want it. I always recommend it. It makes your job a little bit easier. Twelve and thirteen are about disclosures. 12 is about the Virginia Residential Property Disclosure Act. It is applicable on all residential homes that are built except for new construction in our area. So you should have it included. It's essentially saying there's no outstanding liens on the property that will not be paid off, or that will be paid off at closing. It's also disclosing that the property is in fact zone residential. But they think if it was built before 1978, it's obviously required. If it was built after 1978, it's not required. And you want to check this appropriate box here. Another easy one to overlook. Septic system, same thing. If it is not served by a septic system, check the first box. If it is served by a septic system, check whether it's a con check the second box and then check whether it's conventional or alternative. Your seller should know. If it is an alternative system, there's oftentimes a maintenance contract. Just check yes or no whether that's there. I have not seen a waiver in 12 years or so. Um, I'm sure they're out there. Our area does not see these very often. Most septic systems that we see are conventional or alternative and have a maintenance contract. 
But if it is, if it does have a waiver or something like that, um, it's not transferable, you would just disclose this here. Home warranty insurance. This is whether your seller is offering a home warranty with the sale of the property. Pretty self-explanatory. If there's one already in place, go ahead and elect that there's one conveying. Recordings within the property. This is becoming a lot more popular now with like ring cameras and stuff like that. You just have to disclose that they're there or keep them in plain sight. Your owner does not have to turn them off. Yes. Where would they disclose that? Usually in MLS. Rick, do you, is there really a punishment there? I've seen fines, but that's for something different. Um, yeah, I don't think I've not, not that I've heard of, but yeah, it would kind of depend. So if they're just present, it, it usually it just means they forgot to disclose them. Or they're in plain sight. So when I say plain sight, I mean you can look and see that's a camera. I don't mean like oh, so it's right in front of them. They're in plain sight, they don't have to disclose it. That makes sense. Um, so usually that's considered disclosing it. Uh, it is good practice to disclose it in the, in the MLS if it is there. Just put it in the remarks or put it in the agent-only comments, um, especially if it's like a security camera. Just say security cameras convey with the property or security cameras on site, something to that effect. Uh, where I saw the fine in the past was actually because the owners were listening in on the cameras and using what was said as negotiation tactics. This was a couple years ago. And the one thing to let y'all know is in Virginia, for as far as recording, as long as one party in the conversation, if you would, or in this, you know, of the, gives permission for it to be recorded, then it's allowed and they don't even have to disclose that. So, you know, they, they really don't have to disclose that there are things in there. However, um, you know, especially on the buyer side to what Austin just said is you might tell your clients before they go in the house, there may be recording devices, so don't say anything uh, that they would want would not want the seller to know. Because I know of one case in specifically where the buyers went in and they sat down at the kitchen table and were writing up the offer and said, "Well, let's offer such and such, but we'll go to X." And they presented the offer. The offer came back, and imagine this: they countered to X, um, and the agent said. Our sellers heard what your clients were willing to go to. <laughs> so, very, very similar situation would happen online. And I was representing the buyer, so we did have to go up to that higher amount. Um, so it, it does happen. And so to, to the exact point that Rick just said, it is a good practice to disclose to your clients, hey, there may be stuff recording here. Um, I'm seeing it all the time now with ring cameras especially as we're kind of walking up to the front of the house, you see a ring doorbell and it's, it's on, they're listening, I guarantee it. Um, so just be aware of that, be, be privy to that. Another part that's in this section, um, and I disclose this when I meet with the sellers for uh, the initial listing agreement, but I remind them again before photos, anything that they don't want to be seen publicly, go ahead and take it off the walls. Because yep. although we express it to the photographers and although they know it does happen where personal family photos or names or something gets caught, whether it's mirrors, et cetera. So um, we are disclosing that, that, hey, anything you don't want photographs, go ahead and take down um, because we can't prevent buyers from whether it's video recording as they're walking through or taking pictures, et cetera. Can I add one, and it's not, it just clicked in my mind talking about go ahead and do it, get rid of things. If the seller says, you know what, that chandelier or that refrigerator or whatever it is, if those items are not going to convey, we're going to put something else, you know, there, have them do it before they actually put it on the market. Um, years got 25 years ago when I was actually selling, I had a client that had, you know, a chandelier. It, I thought it was the most god awful looking thing I've ever seen, but it was a family heirloom. And they said, we're going to replace that. And I told them to go ahead and replace it. No, we won't. Well, all of a sudden, so we put a does not convey, you know, sign on the thing. Um, and imagine that the buyer who wanted to buy it, they loved that chandelier and they wanted to keep, and that became a huge issue. So anyway. Personal property will do. Um, that's a big kind of back and forth point. I have always practiced where we leave any personal property that's going to convey out of the contract, if it's going to convey, and it's not going to convey, put it in the contract that it doesn't convey. That's what Rick is saying. If it is going to convey, you can leave it out of the listing agreement and put it in the purchase agreement where all parties right. are on the same page. 
because a list integrator means it has to contain it. It's in here. Um, so if they're leaving appliances, et cetera, just leave them out of the listing agreement, disclose them later in the purchase agreement. For buyer best practices, disclose which ones are conveyed. So if you're showing a house and they put all new Samsung appliances in there and you write that addendum up, put it in there, Samsung refrigerator, Samsung stove, Samsung this, Samsung that. Surprise. If you're a listing side, you'll have to disclose the kind. Yes. Uh, you're talking about inside the house, but be careful on the shrub too, you know. Yeah. 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 Yes. And, and, and we'll talk about it when we get to the purchase agreement. But yeah, it's a it's a very specific yeah. uh, language that's used for um, what fixtures convey or don't convey. And if it's not in that language that's already in the purchase agreement, it needs to be written. So refrigerator is a big one. We'll talk about that. Uh, the next long section here, it's really the rest of the listing agreement, is talking about fair housing and the protections there. Um, I'm not going to bore you guys and read through all this because I want to make sure we have enough time to go through the purchase agreement in detail because that's why most of you are here. Um, but if you have any questions or anything that stands out regarding fair housing, this is where it's going to be found. Uh, sections 20 and 21 detail in there are, it is stating that this isn't a legally binding agreement, which may not be modified or changed except by written instrument. This is something I do want to point out because if something is going to be changed on this, even if it's a date, it has to be initialed by all parties. Because that's something that's oftentimes overlooked, especially in this ever-changing market. And we see a lot of times where compliance is being submitted for check to get paid and the listing agreement wasn't dated or wasn't signed or something like that. Just like the buyer brokerage agreement, this is where that signature of broker or authorized agent would go. That is you guys. All right, Rick, anything else to add to the list here? I jump over to the first Perfect. Anybody else? Any questions in the audience or on Zoom on the listing here? All right, cool. So quick reminder as we kind of jump into the biggie here is the buyer brokerage agreement is a relationship between the buyer and Keller Williams in this case or in the brokerage. And then that agent is being assigned to represent the buyer. We just went over the listing agreement, which is the relationship or the agreement between the seller and the brokerage. And then we touched on it, and we're not going to go over too much details because hopefully most of you have seen it already, but the MLS is actually the agreement between the listing brokerage and the selling brokerage or the buying brokerage. Sorry, those words are interchangeable. It's confusing. That's what it means. Selling agent is buyer agent. Listing agent is listing agent. All right, first agreement. This is the relationship between the buyer and the seller. The agreement between the buyer and the seller. Obviously, you guys cannot read that. All right, so formatting a little funky here again. I'm sorry, I will make do as best we can, and this will be improved for next time. But this purchase agreement is dated today between the seller and the purchaser. The parties acknowledge that listing broker represents the seller and selling broker represents the purchaser. These are the brokerages. If you use transaction desk or DocuSign or command or any of those things, these fields should auto populate with the brokerage. Real friendly tip here, if it's the same brokerage in both of those, that should be a friendly reminder to go, oh, I need a dual or designated agency. Real property, purchaser agrees to buy and seller agrees to sell everything that's described below. That's where it's going to pull in the legal description as well as the address, the tax partial ID, that sort of thing. For the property, personal property number two or paragraph two, this is the part we were just talking about. I'm going to read it out loud because I want this, and it is recorded, I want this to be recorded, but I also want you guys to know and listen for what's not said here. Because if it's not in this list, it needs to be disclosed that you're asking for it to convey. Included with the sale of the above real estate, if located within said property at the time of signing this agreement, unless otherwise noted, are the shades, plantation shutters, blinds, curtain and drapery rods, screens and screen doors, storm windows and doors, light fixtures, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, Garbage disposal, range, oven, dishwasher, laundry tubs, attic fan, smoke and heat detectors, awnings, electrical wiring connections for appliances, 
ceiling fans, garage door openers, remotes, mailbox posts, outbuilding sheds, gas logs, fireplace inserts, and all other items attached. That's the big key word there that I was waiting to see. Attached to the real estate and being a part thereof, including all shrubbery and plantings on the property, are included, are also included on this. So essentially what I want you to think is if it's fixed to the house. Now, a refrigerator is not fixed to the house. That can be unplugged and moved. So if you want the refrigerator to convey, notice that that wasn't in there. That's where you're going to disclose it. Very similarly would be a, uh, I just had one, like a deep, like a freezer. The freezer in the garage, a grill. Some of these removal items are ones that oftentimes I see mixed uh, or missed. This says laundry tubs. I still like to disclose that the washer and dryer are going to convey. Whenever in doubt, disclose it. Kind of a rich point earlier, if you really want that light fixture to convey, disclose it. And you can either put it here or you can do a separate addendum. That's going to depend on your lender's preference and whether there's an appraisal and that sort of thing. Because too much personal property can affect the appraisal and that's going to be a conversation for another day, but it would require a bill of sale or a separate addendum to pull it out of the contract. I don't want to confuse you guys with that, but what I really want you to focus on is if you want something to convey with the contract or with the purchase agreement your buyer does, make sure it's disclosed here. We talked about it before. If the seller does not want something to convey, make sure that is disclosed not only in the listing agreement, but then in the MLS because that's how we're disclosing to the other side. The following is that has a question. How do you handle uh, electronics that are mounted or like uh, sound systems also, you know, mounted would be TVs and things like that. How do you we handle that? Yeah, we had that as well. Um, we started disclosing that in the, in the MLS because you're getting a lot of those questions. Uh, the way this reads is the mounts would convey, the electronics would not. At least that's how I've interpreted it because the mounts are what's fixed to the wall. Uh, but best practice is going to be disclose that and make sure all parties agree. Either and on so, or the internet. Yeah, so, and just a tip to people, if the if the mountings are going to convey, make sure that the seller knows that. If they are not going to convey, then the buyer agent needs to tell the buyer, you know what, when they take that mounting off the wall, there's going to be holes in the wall. Uh, and so you need to know that that's going to be the case. And I will not if you want, yeah, if you want the seller to fix them, you need to handle that now at this point, not wait till later to complain about it. Sure. And that kind of goes back to Rick's original point too, which was if I'm going to use myself as a real life example, if I have a mounted TV and I want to take that mount and TV with me, I need to remove that from the wall and fix the holes. If you're a buyer, you need to expect that that's coming down and those holes are not going to be fixed because that's not agreed upon unless we disclose that. So kind of a Rick's point earlier, what we were saying, best practices, if you are going to have a seller want to exchange something, go ahead and have them do it to eliminate the possibility of this issue coming up later. Addendum, what's required is going to be disclosed here. So if it's built before 1978, you are going to require that here. If it's an assets addendum is being included, you do want to check box this here. Right of first refusal, if that's being included, we don't really see those in this market, but if you do see one of those in this market, this is where it would be disclosed. That's a separate addendum. We will talk about that at the next contracts class or the following one, because hopefully they start making the comeback. It's essentially a contingency offer. If you have a house to sell and you want to put an offer in, it's giving you first dibs at that property until you produce a contract or remove your contingency. That agreement is pretty self-explanatory, but there is a separate addendum to fill out. <clears throat> Same thing with the assets addendum. Uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit here when we get to the inspection section, but the as-is addendum is saying just that. We agree to take the property as is. The seller is not warranting or, or responsible for any inspections. So that is different than waiving a home inspection, which we'll get to later. Uh, that's also waiving termite. That's also waiving well and septic if that's prevalent. Just also, keep that in mind. You got a question in the chat, just to let okay. you know. When would you use use of bill of sale, personal property versus writing in section to convey? I like asking the lender as a reference, um, but it's also going to be if there's any money changing hands. So 
if the property is just conveying as is with the contract, you could probably put it in a addendum on its own, just a separate addendum, and say all parties agree this these items convey with the purchase agreement. If you are going to be exchanging money or paying for the personal property, there is a bill of sale document where you would use that to fill it out. If you really want to be transparent, you can do the bill of sale and put zero dollars on there, whatever is most comfortable. Big question. That's more of a lender thing. The lenders aren't going, right. don't want to be lending money on personal property. That's, that's exactly right. So that's why we say pull it in the, into an addendum out of this personal contract. If the appraisal is off by seven grand and you're asking for a $10,000 hot tub, now you can see why people are going to argue. Uh, another kind of best practice tip here, I know it's hard to see because my formatting is all whacked out, but where it says other on your agreement, um, if you are including an escalation addendum or an escalation clause addendum, go ahead and check that box and write escalation clause if applicable. And we're not necessarily going over the es escalation clause today because we just did two weeks ago in the last broker moment. But the reason why is because the escalation clause addendum, in order for that to be ratified, if you're winning an offer, you have to come back and initial the final purchase price. So if you have put this in this addendum, you're going to obviously cross it out when you update the purchase price. So it's kind of a friendly reminder. Does that make sense to everybody? Sorry, it's not, it sounds kind of like helpful. And, and Austin, you may have covered this when you all talked about the escalation. Um, but in the escalation clauses, normally it requires that a, a copy of the other offer is provided. And so back to kind of agency, part of the code of ethics also says that you know, you need to let your clients know that their offers and things like that are not um, confidential. So, uh, you know, a lot of people, well, you, you can't show that. Well, yeah, the, the seller can show your offer because it's not confidential. That makes sense. Eric. So an offer is not confidential. A contract is. Yes. So you contracted to buy a house. That's why pending listings in the don't have the terms. So a, a contract, once it's ratified and accepted by all parties, is confidential. But a highest and best offer is not confidential. The seller doesn't have to respond to the offer. So they don't like the offer, they don't have to send a response to the payment. Yes, and so to repeat that, uh, Jason asked, the seller does not have to respond to an offer the only tidbit there is if the offer, and Rick and I had a conversation about this last week, if the offer is equal to or better than what you advertise the property for sale for. So if you list a house for $100,000 in the MLS and you get a $100,000 cash offer, it's expected your seller's gonna take that. Now, if you get an $80,000 offer, you'd say no. Does that make sense to everybody? So if you are just, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of falling into that false advertising category or mindset is if you're advertising a property for sale, especially in this market, it's good to know that like there is such thing as listing too low right now because if that's the only offer you get, that's what you're expected to sell for at that list price. So don't list too far below a market value if you aren't going to get multiple offers. I had a second thought to that. Was it a bit? It's the MLS rules is the one that says, you know, that if you put it in at 100,000 and, and a cash offer comes in at that price, you don't then counter back and say, no, I want 110 because that's actually against the MLS rules. If you're not prepared, if the seller is not prepared to accept a offer at what their list price is, then you can't put it in the MLS. And that's negated, obviously, if there's multiple offers or better terms. Yes, right? exactly. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and the, hot, the, the escalation clause that we were talking about earlier, that, that addendum, it does specifically say a copy of the highest and best bona fide offer will be shown because that's how you determine the value of the escalation clause. So I don't want to go too much in detail there because we'll talk about that another time. But uh, purchase price here and then whether the sale is subject to financing or not. What I really want to stress here is the importance of having a relationship with the lender that you're writing an offer with because they're going to help you fill this section out clearly. But more importantly, please fill this section out <laughs> because I'm seeing a lot of times where uh, we're getting, oh yeah, it's subject to financing, it's a conventional loan and that's it. And we don't see any details as far as how much money they're putting down. Um, 
if it's at the prevailing interest rate of time of settlement, et cetera. There's actually typically some check boxes here it got cut off. Well, yeah, and, and to the point, what he just said about prevailing market rate, if your buyer client is tight and so, you know, they can only afford it if it's at five and a quarter percent and um, you don't fill in, that's the, you know, rate that they're going for and the market where the prevailing rate is 6% when they finally get, you know, around to it and then they can't uh, get it, that's an issue, so. And then, yeah, to kind of summarize or add to that, uh, let's say you went under contract and you were shopping a rate and when you got pre-approved, it was 5%, you go under contract, it's now 6%. The lender says you can still afford to, to buy the house. The buyer, if they're under contract and this is accepted, they can't turn around and say, oh, I didn't know it was 6%. That mortgage payment's higher than I wanted to go. If the lender's saying they're pre-approved and you're under contract at that point, you're expected to execute that contract. So it is important to kind of have that conversation with your folks up front. Another tidbit here is, because we're seeing this more and more now, buyers are qualifying for more than one type of loan. So for example, a veteran wants to use their VA loan, but they have cash to put down. An agent may see this and see veteran or VA loan 100% financing and think that that buyer doesn't have cash. So this is a friendly tip if you're in a multiple offer situation or you're using a client that's putting less money down than they have, have your lender share proof of funds, especially if you're doing an appraisal gap or something like that. That's just a tip to make your offer presented in its strongest form. One other thing just on VA, because there's some people, so a couple different things with VA, sorry, Austin, oh, you're fine. is remember that as far as appraisal for a VA loan, and maybe you were going to cover this later, but uh, as far as an appraisal for a VA loan, if it does not appraise, even if they write in the, the offer and it's ratified, that the buyer will agree to pay $20,000 over appraisal or whatever, you know, if it doesn't appraise, that buyer still has the right to get out. Even though they agreed to it up front, the VA rules say that that buyer does not have to take it if it doesn't appraise. So that's one thing. There have been a couple listing agents who have told their clients, oh, don't worry about it. You know, they agree to go over and then the buyer walks and they're allowed to do that. So and that's a good point too, because in 2019, our board or our Central Virginia board, uh, they passed that you can no longer deny an offer solely based on financing type. Correct. Now it's a little different now because you can make that argument of if somebody's putting $100,000 down versus $5,000 down, it's the exact same price. There's probably something else that's differing in that offer. Um, so that's where we say solely based on financing. Um, but just keep that in mind when you're working with clients that you want to make sure you're disclosing their their powers and their protections. And that veteran loan, and FHA does the same thing, doesn't it? No, no, they, they, they can still started. they can still go over if they want okay, to. Okay, good. Yeah, so you can still you can, yeah you can still pay over the VA loan. You cannot. Uh, right. So you got in mind. One other thing on VA, just to let you know, is a veteran cannot pay any of your commissions or admin fees. So if you're going to, if you put in a buyer agency agreement that you're going to get 3% plus $400 admin fee, and then, and they're offering 3% in the MLS, you can't, that buyer, that veteran buyer cannot pay you that admin fee. And it will get spit out by the yeah. underwriter. Yep. You know that same thing if you have 3% on the buyer buyer agency and you sell them a new construction, it's 2%. You can't, right. go, you can't go after them for the extra. What about uh, for sale by owner? So it if it's a VA loan, same thing. Okay. Doesn't so, matter. Yeah, if it's a VA loan, doesn't matter. If it's any other loan type, different. Um, so, kind of the next point here is. Uh, the terms of the financing, the loan length, and typically that's 30 years. Typically there's no discount points. And right now, typically there's no sale of paid closing costs either. Um, but that's where that would go in that next section. So 
Uh, just keep that in mind. Again, have that conversation with your lender on what the terms are that your, your client is presenting. And another best practice friendly tip, have your lender reach out to that listing agent and have that conversation. Or at least send them an email that kind of says, hey, this client has been through these steps of the process, whether it's underwriting, whether it's credit approval, et cetera. All right, section five. This has become a pretty sticking point recently. Obviously, you've heard a lot about the appraisal gaps and waiving the appraisal of the outcome uh, or, or waiving appraisal. What I wanted to, to stress here is there should be two check boxes here, but this sale is or is not subject to the property's appraised value. If it is cash or if you have written consent from the lender that they can waive the appraisal, then you would check it as not further subject to. If you are waiving the what's called the appraisal outcome or you're paying some sort of cash amount over appraisal, you do still need to check that it's subject to an appraised value. Nine times out of 10, if they're using a loan, it's subject to the appraised value. If they're putting more than 20% down, they may be able to get a waiver depending on the borrower's qualifications. And to Alston's point, he says about the buyer, you know, if you're representing the buyer and they're trying to do this and say, we're going to pay over top, have that lender share the, their funds that they've got or the buyer can do it if they want. But if they don't provide that, you as the listing agent, um, you better ask for that up front before you accept that because all of a sudden you get settlement. Well, we don't have the cash for it. We just wanted to win the contract. It's and that is happening where people are saying, oh, I'll pay 50K over appraisal. That's why if you haven't noticed, there's a little more back on market homes coming yeah. through and, and they disclose that as buyer financing fell through. That's a buyer financing issue if they can't come to the agreed upon price. Does that make sense to, to everyone? It's, and it, it is something that's newer because of the market we are in. Um, so just keep that in mind. Let me see what Mary Mart is. Oh. Can a purchaser say they are approved for both an FHA at one amount and a conventional at another amount if it escalates, or do they need to select one type of loan or an offer? The offer is going to need to be disclosed. Uh, the loan type is going to be disclosed on the prop or on the offer. Um, if that's the case, I would typically say conventional. You can always change the loan type later with agreement by all parties. So that can be something that can come up later. Um, even if they are paying some cash for any gap, they need to check the is subject to. Yes, correct. So, and that's kind of what I was talking about or referring to earlier. Um, we see this a lot right now where people are paying, um, and that's actually a perfect example. Folks are offering as FHA and they're only putting three and a half percent down because A, they like that mortgage payment, uh, but also B, they're saving that extra cash they have to pay over appraisal. So you would write the offer in that scenario as it's an FHA offer, but you're going to want to have that proof of funds and or that lender conversation with the listing agent saying, hey, they're approved to go conventional and they have this amount of money in the bank, but they're using that money towards the appraisal gap. Were you going to cover the alternate financing? How the ramifications of that? But we can. Just that, you know, to Alston's point, you are definitely allowed to do a different type of financing. But if you put in the contract that you're going to get FHA and then you go conventional and you get rejected for conventional, it's not going to save you. Um, you still, you need to get rejected for the specified financing in order to kind of get out free. Correct. But that's also kind of why you see it kind of the opposite way or the way with the put the less down payment option on the contract yeah. if you're yep. saving yep. those funds for an appraisal. Now, to kind of follow up that, fast forward, you get to a week or two before closing, appraisal actually comes in higher or comes in okay, and they're not going to have to use as much money, money to put down. You can put more than 3.5% three, three down and stay FHA. Yeah. Um, you don't have to be conventional just because you're putting more than 3.5% down. Again, a little bit more on the lending side, have that conversation with the lender on what's best for your clients. Um, that is kind of talking about uh, or getting into section six here, which is talking about financing. I'm not going to bore you to death with all these details, but you should know this. The biggest one sticking out here is they need to have that loan commitment letter within seven days. Most of this is already avoided because 
if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing as a buyer's agent, they hopefully have already obtained financing or at least a pre-approval letter before you're working with them. Uh, but this is essentially saying that you're going to provide that agreed upon contract to the lender and the buyer is going to proceed. Make forward. application. Yeah, that application. Wire fraud alert, it's just disclosing that wire fraud is used um, and that emails that look legitimate may not be. And so just seek representation or counsel before you agree to wire anything. Deposit, this is your earnest money deposit, your escrow deposit is another way that this is typically called. Um, this should be disclosed up front. It, they can do more. There's no real standard form here. Uh, I tell our agents to off, to put at least 1% down. You do want to make sure you're familiar with the seller's options and the buyer's options with regards to what happens to that deposit. We're going to talk about this a lot more in the next couple of uh, sections, but really the big takeaway here is don't hold the deposit on your own. Best practice tip, have your client take it directly to the seller agent. If they use Vesta, friendly tip, they have a mobile deposit. You don't even have to have them leave their house. Uh, but a lot of other settlement agencies have that too. The real reason why is they, your client will get a copy of their EMD or receipt upon submitting that. And this amount is going to come out of your client's checking account. So they want to know, like, oh, where did my money go? Oh, it's in an escrow account. Yes. So are you supposed to put Vesta there or are there, uh, they have another name? So you would put whoever. Uh, you would put whoever the uh, hold on, Zoom. I'll get with you. I you would, said purchaser settlement agent. Purchaser settlement agent there is perfect, and that's what I was about to say. You would put whoever the settlement company is. Um, so a purchaser's agent, uh, a purchaser settlement company is fine. Hold on, Zoom. I gotta. Uh, that all right. They changed their mind. So they can yeah. Exactly. And I was just about to say, if they do change their mind, and we had this happen recently where they were using a title company, they decided to move over to Vesta because Vesta was representing the seller side. And so we just had that part of the contract condition. Um, I want to follow along. Those on Zoom, I'm going to need to get somebody back in here on the computer. Because, yeah, let me see. What do you have what questions? I, see, I just had a contract up for the people on Zoom. Oh. oh, hold on. Yeah, I can. All right. Give me two seconds. So you don't need to read questions from them. No. Oh. Rick, this is Juanita. But while he's pulling that up, can I just make sure I understood something you said about um, um, the VA? If you have a VA buyer, you cannot charge them mm -hmm. the three per the. 395 admin fee or 400 or any admin fee. Did I hear right. that correctly? Okay. That would, or, I mean, you can still, you can charge one, but it needs to be paid by the seller or somebody else. It can't be paid by the buyer. Okay. And that's just for VA, right? Not just for, for VA, uh, correct. Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah, I didn't know that. See, I learned something in every class. Yep. <laughs> Good to see your face. Thank you. What did they change my password to? <laughs> well, help me with that um, auto save on it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Where's my face ID when I need it? Austin, it must be something about brokers that have problems with their passwords because I'm the I same way. I swear. I, you would think naming it after my kid would help me, but. <laughs> That's why I named the um, property heated properties too, so it's just the company. Uh, so those on Zoom, let me share my screen. Said I wasn't tech savvy. Can you guys see that from Zoom? Yeah. Oh, wow. That didn't take long at all. Okay. All right. Um, so we're on deposit. We're coming back down into nine. Nine is going to be a settlement possession. Great point that Catherine just made is if you are not sure, if your buyers are not sure, you can put purchaser settlement company or purchaser's choice of settlement company in both of these blanks. 
That way, you don't have to change the data. Questions, concerns on that one? Oh, I just, not about that one, but something just popped in my head to before when you were talking about you're not seeing very many first rider refusals. Just make sure um, if the purchase of the property is con basically the financing uh, or the funds for the property are contingent on selling or renting another property, that has to be disclosed. You can't just to try and win the contract, not put it in there. Um, so anyway, yeah, I know some agents sense. are trying to do that. Does that make sense? And I know it's a little bit, uh, it may seem redundant in this market because obviously we expect every listing to sell right away, but you do still need to disclose that. So if there is some sort of contingency for that contract to be void or to be valid, you do need to disclose that in the contract. Cool. Settlement so possession, we just highlighted this a second ago, but uh, same offices, a reasonable time thereafter. Almost always check this box. And the reason why is because a reasonable time thereafter, most attorneys will agree is 30 days. I would, that, I would love to be honest. Don't debate me. <laughs> I think it can be a multiple, multiple of things depending on the reason. Um, I have found most of the time this is 30 days, a reasonable time thereafter, so long as both parties are making their due, due, due diligence to close. And that's going to be a real determining factor. Um, we have seen a few circumstances lately where people just try to change their mind. There has to be a legitimate reason, and that legitimate reason is going to be found in this agreement, whether it's a breach of contract or something like that. Uh, but how, how do you enforce that? So even if people agree that 30 days is reasonable, what are the steps to do to enforce this part of the contract? For a settlement to occur? Typically, it's going to be some sort of either negotiation first and then mediation and arbitration. So that's typically, if, if closing is being delayed and the representation in this case, both the agents cannot seem to come to an agreement, whether it's their parties or one party or the other, that's when you're going to lean into the settlement attorneys or those closing companies to take over communication. And that's when they're going to have a little bit more of a legalese conversation. Um, but yeah, typically it's going to be we negotiated something um, or there's going to be some form of sacrifice of the EMD. And again, it's kind of hard to, to broad brush this because it depends on the circumstances. But uh, so I think what you're saying is there's nothing. So the buyer's refusing to close. There's nothing that the sellers can do within 30 days because 30 days is considered reasonable time. That's been my experience. Rick, do you guys see anything differently up there? Sorry, what was that? For a reasonable time thereafter of closing, like a buy so well, if a buyer is refusing to close or it's past that 30 day mark, um, we're just discussing ramifications. What would happen after that? Our I contract up here is it is definitely time is of the essence. So if they don't, if settlement's supposed to be tomorrow and they don't settle tomorrow, they're the buyer's out of luck. So what would the party, happen? The party that doesn't settle is basically out of luck. They're um, so uh, they would need to do an extension. It's so we are very, time is of the essence. But they have their clause more similar to the second. To the second one. Yeah, to the second one. Yeah, the second that one. is a 10-day yes. time of essence. And, and a lot of it is going to depend on, like I said earlier, the, the case by case scenario. So, uh, and builder contracts are a little bit different, but if you were using this on the house that's being built or being finished or renovated or something like that, and closing is taking place because of contractor delays, that's something different than, say, a buyer intentionally not closing. So some of that is going to be case by case scenario, um, but it is going to be in your best interest to refer to the attorney at that case if you're depending on what side you're on. Make sense? Caught a lot there. Um, Rick, you made me think of something. That that was, oh, sorry. That's okay. You'll come. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> possession can also be negotiated. It is understood to be given at settlement unless otherwise agreed to in writing. So right now, common is a rent back. That has to be agreed to in writing. And there are standard forms, and we just talked about this on Tuesday. So if you don't know what it is, it's CBR 330. Oh, the only thing I'll add to this one is, especially with some of the older clients that you might have, they will think, well, I'm not going to give possession until I get my money. So you as a listing agent explain to them that that is not what settlement is per the contract. So 
um, and that it will probably take at least two business days before they get their money. And it's boldly for that reason. Uh, another thing that we found a lot more often in the past than, than lately is uh, that's possession of the property. So for whatever reason we have run into sellers that say, okay, cool, closing's on May 13th. That's great. When do I need to be out by? Yeah. <laughs> May 13th, that's the discussion about. Um, unless it's all about three o'clock. So just, it, it seems overkill, but you'd be surprised. Uh, occupancy disclosure. Just disclosing whether they plan to occupy the property as their primary residence. It's really going to apply to their financing uh, more than anything, but you just want to make sure that's disclosed here. Residential property disclosure, same thing. We talked about this earlier, but if it is subject to the RPD, a residential property disclosure, you do want to disclose that. And you do want to make sure it's a part of this agreement because if a lien is found that's not going to be paid off as a part of settlement, and this agreement was not made part of this contract, your buyer could be forced to still close on that house and incur that lien. Could be. So again, got a broad brush right there. Yes. Can we go back to settlement? Yeah. Um, and maybe have you and Rick both answer. So we kind of skipped over the second paragraph choice, which does provide the 10 days time that's of essence. So that can you and Rick weigh in about that paragraph and why you or would not use that one. Rick, do you want to touch on that? Because y'all use time of the essence up there. Um, yeah, but I don't. I don't y'all use y'all's contract very much. That's true. Um, I mean, I'm so used to using it. I feel like time is of the essence is a good one to use, but I don't know why not to use it. I would say, I would say from from reading this, it is probably more substantial in this market right now to use this because time is more of the essence right now because we see how quickly things are selling and how quickly things are changing hands. Um, it is probably a better protection there for right now for your clients. The only reason why I would use A for reasonable time thereafter is if for some reason delay is going to occur and you maybe have forecast of that, like I mentioned earlier, if it's a new construction or it's something where Maybe it's contingent on a settlement of another house or contingent on a tenant moving out. Sometimes you need to build in a little bit of that cushion. So that reasonable time thereafter could be an advantage to all parties. However, unfortunately, you also need to plan for a worst case scenario, which would be somebody changing their mind and just saying, oh, I don't want to buy this house anymore. Um, or maybe like we talked about earlier, financing is a little more than they wanted to spend. If the lender says they are still approved to buy a house, they're still expected to buy the house. They can't just say, oh, I don't want to. Good question. So yeah, so focus on either one of those. It's going to be case by case scenario. B is probably protecting you a little bit better if you are the listing side. You're probably going to want to see that. If you're the buyer side, hopefully you don't have anybody want to back out of a house, but or needing more time, but you may want that that cushion. It's kind of going to depend. Can I just bring one little quick point up on number ten, occupancy disclosure? Yes. Um, if they do say that they're going to be that it's going to be their primary residence, they have to move in within 60 days of settlement. So if there's gonna be a post-occupancy agreement or something like that, you better not make it for more than 60 days because the then they'll have to get investor financing. So, I was just, that's a great point because most investor or most lenders, excuse me, are going to catch that. Um, when you see a, an extended seller possession agreement, if it's a primary occupancy uh, or a primary residency that they're gonna live in, that can't be longer than 60 days. So if you hear us talking about rent backs over conversation, you say, oh, yeah, the max is 60 days. That's what they're referring to. If it's going to be longer than that, you usually move closing or um, it's not a primary occupancy. Great. All right, down to 12, uh, fair housing disclosure, all offers shall be presented and count, uh, considered with protections in mind. We talked about that before. 13 and 14 are property owner association and condo disclosures. Now, if it isn't an HOA, we talked about this before, and you probably remember from your licensing class, that if it is an HOA, once it goes under contract, the HOA disclosures, resale packets, et cetera, are expected to be ordered ASAP, as soon as possible. Don't forget to scroll down on the computer. Thank you. Just waiting for somebody's notes. Now, once received, and once receipt is acknowledged, the three-day count clock starts. Best practice tip again, if you were on the listing side, you order a resale disclosure packet, it comes to you, and you are in charge of forwarding it to the buyer, please confirm receipt. 
And if you do not receive confirmation, drag it down, call them, text them, email them again, make sure they receive that document. Within the question, if, if the document is not a, a whole document, I mean, it's not all the different things that are required, it's still once it, once anything has been sent or notice that nothing will be sent, the buyer's clock starts ticking. And within those three days, the buyer can terminate this agreement for that exact reason. You can say, hey, you decided not to send me the disclosure, this is the protection. Uh, matter of fact, I think it's Peggy Lynch that was talking about this. Um, you cannot, as a buyer, waive this requirement in the state of Virginia Correct. as an attempt to make your offer stronger. The buyer is entitled to this protection no matter what. Don't do that. Um, and then you have those three days to review the HOA resale package and uh, HOA covenants to make sure there's nothing in there that would prevent your buyer from buying the house. It actually talks about this, I think kind of to Rick's point that he just said, if, if you receive a packet that's maybe out of date or not complete, requesting an updated one or a more recent one does not start the time on it. Go backwards. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, but that's kind of the, uh, the, the gray area there. So you wanna make sure that A, you're confirming receipt, B, all the documents are there that are supposed to be there. And CBR has done better about, like, like I said earlier, the company HomeWise, um, Associa Group is the other big one that I think manages a lot of people, but they've done a better job of making this information available to agents so we can get it to the parties in a timely manner, um, but it, it can be complicated. So if you ever run into an HOA issue or a sticking point, reach out to somebody in the office because we have a lot of resources here that can help. Experience that. Mary, Mary Margaret has a thing on the chat. And so she's asking if you get the packet prior to making the offer, when does the when does the three days start? It would start at ratification. Yep. Yep. It's the three days after, right? Day one is always the day after. Correct. Yeah, you get it. Right. Yeah, so day one is is the is the calendar date after. And notice it is calendar days. It's not business days. There was another question earlier um, that I got overlooked on my computer diet. Said how long can the builder delay closing? It's gonna kind of depend. And the only reason why is because a lot of builders use their own contracts. And a lot of builders on contracts are very builder friendly. Yes. Not very buyer friendly. Um, so to answer your question truthfully, if it's a builder contract, however long they want. If it's yep. a CBR contract, it depends whether you fill out that A or B. A has found to be usually 30 days. B, like we talked about on that, that option is 10 days. So that was Renisha's question there. Um, some builder contracts have disclosed days in there. More often than not, if it's being delayed, they claim it's supply issues. That is how I say they claim. Um, but that's it. Condo disclosure, think similarly to the HOA disclosure. It's just disclosing that it's a condo. There are a few more documents that get included with that. Um, if it is subject to a condo resale, it does have to be disclosed, and the same rules apply to before to the HOA. Questions on that stuff? Another tip on condo, uh, make sure you have conversed with the lender that the financing type your client is receiving can purchase a condo. Not all condos are FHA approved, not all condos are VA approved. So if your client's receiving a government backed loan, that's kind of the kicker there. You're not gonna receive a USDA loan condo, let's say the government backed loan, um, but VHDA, VA, FHA, just make sure that condo is approved. And it may get tougher and tougher to get condos in the future because right now so many investors are buying these properties and that's lots of times why they can't get it. If, if the ratio of, of investors to homeowners is too high, they won't lend on them. Correct. So you know, it's kind of a different way of thinking about that too is if you're an investor buying a condo, um, there are rental restrictions in certain condo communities too. So if you're, maybe you know they're paying cash or they're paying uh conventional loan or something like that. Actually, two of our agents here, this just happened to. They bought a condo with the intention of turning into a rental. They found out that they were already above the rental cap, and so they ended up turning it into a flip. So they're flipping it to sell out. Yeah, Mike and Lisa, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that, that can happen. And in fact, there's a lot of ones that seem like they would be 
because there's a lot of turnover in there, you would think that they would be applicable to all types of financing and they're not. So just don't do your due diligence there. Other association repairs, this is kind of a big one because uh, it's oftentimes forgotten about in multiple offer situations. If an HOA or a condo association is requir requiring repairs to be done, the purchaser has a right to terminate the contract if the repairs are not being done. Now, if you are writing an offer for a buyer and you are waiving certain inspection repairs, be sure to de uh, designate which inspection repairs, home inspection repairs and HOA re inspection repairs or HOA inspection repairs. Does that make sense? If you're doing an as is addendum, I believe it supersedes this. Am I correct in that, Rick? I think you're right. I'll double check. But yeah, if you use an as is addendum, it's saying you're taking the property as is. I don't think it calls out the condo section, though. I mean, the HOA section. Okay. Yeah, I'll double check that because yeah. now it's starting to mess with my brain. Um, and I, I've seen it before where some HOA won't let property change it. Like some HOAs make it a mandatory fix. It kind of depends on the repair that's required. Um, but yeah, we'll double check this. Section 16, this is the, per, the property inspection section that we were talking about. So purchaser waives property inspection. That's option A or option one, um, the first one. Again, like we talked about before, if you're waiving home inspection, this does not waive. I'll come back to you, Mary Margaret, in a second. Um, this does not waive your termite or your well and septic. Oh, that's the same question. Um, so if, if you're waiving the home inspection here, this is not waiving, there should be a checkbox here, but that first box there is not waiving termite or well and septic if that's applicable. The next long section here, I'm not going to read it and bore you guys to death, but you should familiarize yourself with this. The big takeaways here is a repairs request addendum must be made within certain days of ratification that you fill out here in this blank. If nothing is checked, please don't check nothing. Please fill it out. But if nothing is checked, it defaults to seven days. No, 10 days. Defaults to 10 days. Seven days in the negotiation period. So defaults to 10 days. That means 10 days from the time of inspection, the buyer is expected to produce a, a full inspection report and a request for repairs to the seller. They can also ask for a credit in lieu of repairs. But when it comes to credits, two things. Seller doesn't have to accept anything. Seller can also not force the buyer to take a credit in lieu of repairs, no matter what the balance. is. So that's something that kind of gets brought up a lot in our team meetings is, well, we offer them more than the repairs are going to be. And sorry, they don't have to take that. The buyer can request that, matter of fact, they should request that the repairs are done by a licensed contractor, licensed by the state board, the Virginia Board of Contractors. But they do not have to request the seller to perform any inspections to show repairs were done. It does go in here to talk about receipts being provided prior to closing. It talks about the negotiation period back and forth. I want you to think seven days from the first request. So when the buyer sends that first request over, you have seven days. This period is longer to allow the seller opportunity to get quotes, to put in layman's terms, so they can shop their own contractors, get their own stuff looked at. Once the seller performs or gives a formal response back, your negotiation period shrinks, and it becomes three days back and forth. If an agreement is not met within three days, parties may terminate. It's back and forth. So every time, the other thing that's key here on a repairs request, if Catherine's the buyer side on the listing side, she produces the repairs request and I submit a response back, her original one is null and void. And every single time we count it back, it supersedes all of the ones. So it keeps one document moving forward. Make sense? Uh, optional paragraph, something that probably the least favorite added thing to the contract over the last several years um, is a buyer protection and not a seller one. So um, I'm going to be a little biased here because I mostly work with listings right now. Um, this is an optional paragraph. It's essentially saying that the purchaser, if they do a home inspection, can terminate the contract without requesting any repairs. Friendly tip, you should ask for repairs because you never know what the seller is willing to fix. 
An A contract is better than no contract. Part of this inspection agreement is also that the seller will have all utilities on and all utilities accessible to the inspector for the time of home inspection. If you arrive at a home inspection and find something to be off or not on, it automatically starts and moves the timeline. So it automatically changes the timeline to 10 days and from and 10 days from the start of when those utilities are put on. So we've had this happen. You show up, vacant house, seller said they left the utilities on, they didn't. You have to wait for Dominion to turn it back on. Dominion takes three days, then it starts back up. You can also extend contingency periods. Inspection is a contingency period. You can extend this in writing as long as it's agreed to by all parties. I meant to mention that earlier. Um, I forget who it was. T. William, maybe. I was just having this conversation with somebody last week. Uh, if it might have been Danielle, doesn't matter. If there's a contingency and you need to extend it, so for example, we were trying to get a, a condo resale document or a condo was ordered and they were trying to get something worked out, um, they basically put it in an addendum that all parties agreed to extend that contingency. So the buyers weren't going to walk away because they hadn't received something. Rule of thumb there is just disclose all parties' interests and get everybody to agree to it. If you have questions or concerns, like this one was a very specific contingency, I can't remember off the top of my head, but we worked through it. Hey, before we move on, Austin, is yeah. um, for Rick, is that uh, new thing any different than the void only from the NBAR contract? Well, that, that box is basically the same. If you do the box where you can just void only. And what the reason they're trying to do that is because you've got agents still to this day that are, they'll leave the home inspection in and then they'll put in other terms, you know, inspection for informational purposes only. And which really I hate to say means nothing. So um, that's, I think, why CVR gave this option of a void only. Yeah, you can do a home inspection, but you've only got the option to void. Um, so, and please don't write in for informational purposes only because there's been no legal case or anything like that to say, oh, that means, I mean, that you don't get to get out or you do get to get out or whatever. So it's, you don't want to be that test case for going to court. That's a, that's a really good point too. And we're working on a standardized clause document from a couple of different parties that we're going to put together for the office. So when it comes to like waiving an appraisal outcome, waiving inspection repairs, stuff like that, we're going to have a little bit more standardized language for you guys. Uh, but that is a great point. Don't put uh, another favorite one I saw was we'll forgive any repairs found. I guess so nice of you to forgive the fact that you need um, use wave repairs um, and, and preferably put a credit amount or a dollar amount on the repairs um, or wave them completely. All right, Rick, anything else you want to add to that inspection section? I don't want to just straight read through it. Thank um, you. Okay. That good. Cool. So next section, uh, page six, we're talking about default. This is kind of going back to what we're talking about with the closing um, is, well, what happens if something's not... If somebody's not doing what they're supposed to do. That is called if they're in default or breach of this contract. So the defaulting party or the, the party in breach is essentially liable for all things that have been agreed upon. We spent a lot of day talking about the differing agreements, but in this situation, if somebody's in breach of a purchase agreement, that defaulting party could be liable for the buyer's commission, the seller's commission, and other liquidated damages. Just keep that in mind. And it does go in to say that if it sells to someone else, that doesn't take away the commissions that are owed. Bingo. And it also doesn't take away, uh, again, not as, not as common right now, but it has happened in the past. If I was under contract to sell my house for 450000 the buyer was in breach of contract or change their mind or wouldn't close. We put it back on the market. We sell for 400000 I can also go after them for that $50,000 loss I incurred. Every month that you're on the market, carrying costs yeah yeah there's a lot there yeah so um that's kind of where that snowball can build yeah. as far as yeah mortgage utilities uh, moving costs if you had to move a couple different times there choice of settlement agent this is important just to highlight especially um in our market there are a lot of joint ventures a lot of uh, title companies with mutual party interests so we just want to make sure we're always disposing that that's why we always decide Investa and mclean 
relationship form and all of our transactions. But this is just saying that, hey, you do have your choice to your own settlement agent. And just to let you, even if the parties agree to, you know, X in the contract, the buyer always has the right to change it. That's exactly what I was going to say, too. The seller cannot require the buyer to use a settlement company of their choosing. Nor can they require a lender of their choosing. Can encourage it, they can't require it. Brokerage fee, seller authorizes and directs the settlement agent to disperse to listing broker and selling broker from settlement proceeds. This is just disclosing that all parties agree that how the brokerage fee is being paid. Again, back to what we talked about earlier, the MLS is what that agreement is. So screenshot that. When you make an offer and the offer gets accepted, you want to grab that MLS. Unfortunately, there are people out there that have been known to go in there and change that. Home warranty insurance, again, if there's one being provided, this is kind of similar to what we talked about with the settlement company too. If, in fact, you should be suggesting a home warranty to your buyers in this market, especially, um, but you don't necessarily have to suggest a company. So you can put purchaser's warranty or purchaser's choosing um, and then put a rounded up cost there. And then they can decide later. I don't know how many of them do this, but I know First American does. If you close, you have up to 60 days to add that home warranty. Um, I think they all do that. I just saw a First American thing this morning. Made me think of that. Related businesses and services, the listing broker and seller broker may engage in mortgage loan, et cetera. Um, and we may have additional fees and compensation there. It's just disclosing this. Scroll up. Up or down? I keep or going. down, I guess you're correct. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, so we're here on 20 and 21 that we just went over. You are disclosing that you do not own any real or personal property that must be that cut off there, sold and settled. So this is the purchaser disclosing their own are no other contingencies. Rick touched on this earlier, but if there is another contingency, you do have to disclose that separately. Now, a question I got this week, uh, if you are an agent and you are buying the house, meaning you're writing an offer for yourself, you have to disclose that you're licensed in the state of Virginia. The easiest place to do that Section 23, write in additional terms. If you're the seller, same thing. Say that again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. License in the Commonwealth of Virginia. All right, standard provisions. These are going back over the seller agrees to pay their closing costs, which is the expense of pay, preparing the deed and the applicable taxes. That they will transfer title. It's also disclosing that they do, in fact, have title to the property. Land use assessment, we don't see this that often in our market, but if it is a specific property or zone for a specific land use, if this sale results in disqualifying from that, um, the seller would be responsible for any rollback taxes. Again, don't see that that often. Risk of loss, more of an insurance question here, but um, this is just going over what can happen damages wise if something were to occur while you're under contract. Through. Yes, that is a great point because um, you would be surprised the state of the property that it is left in. And this is going into the equipment condition and inspection. Sh seller shall convey and purchaser agrees to accept the property at settlement in its physical condition at the time of ratification, unless otherwise agreed upon, which is talking about repairs requests. So that's why it's especially important. We talked about this before, but Appliances is a big one that gets overlooked. Um, if you are writing an offer on a house and you want those appliances to convey, disclose what type of appliances they were. And then when you do the walkthrough, make sure they're still there. Broom clean is the million dollar language or million dollar word for how a uh, property should be transferred. Um, but broom clean means just that it doesn't justify if there's holes in the wall or something like that. So um, substantial damage to the property, this is where that protection is. Rick, did I leave anything out there? Nope. I didn't think so. uh, F, did I get, okay, cool. Well, in septic systems, we would have disclosed it on the listing agreement, but if there is a well, you need to check that. If there is a septic system, you need to check that. Unless and as this addendum is provided, the seller is responsible for providing such inspections here. It's going to talk about that in the next pages. 
If it's a municipal system, that means public or city water. Well, wood infestation, termite inspection here, that's what this is talking about. Very similar to what we just went over a second ago with the well and septic. Termite also applies to that as is addendum. So if you are just trying to waive the home inspection, just waive the home inspection. If you want everything waived, it would be an as is addendum required. Now, if there are any additional structures to the property that you want to have inspected, such as like a detached outbuilding or something like that for the termite, this long blank here under wood infestation, which you can't see, is where that would be. And limitation, again, most high D or high SC listing agents would like to see a fully co uh, completed contract. So even though it defaults to $1,000 if left, left blank, go ahead and write that in there. Um, another thing that I have seen that makes offers stronger is if you don't want them to have to fix anything, you can set a lower limit. But that's a lending question too. Check with your lender. Some loan types will require treatment. All right, VA and FHA loan. If it's selected here, this is talking about forfeiture of money deposits and kind of what we already talked about earlier with the VA loan and the appraisal language. Now, one thing I wanted to add here that Chris Park shared is a little friendly tip. He talked to me this morning about it. If you have done a VA or an FHA loan before, there's an amendatory clause that gets signed later. Where this has caused some issues is the amendatory clause essentially states language as it reiterates the appraisal protection. So real life scenario, you put an FHA offer in, you agree to pay $20,000 over appraisal, Everybody's happy, fine and dandy, sign the agreement, move it on. Three weeks later, they get the seller, the buyer, the listing, agreement, uh, listing agent, and the selling agent, the buyer's agent, are all expected to sign this form that now says if an appraisal comes in below the purchase agreement, that's the new price. And so it creates a friction layer, even though you've already agreed upon it. If you sign this contract as the buyer's agent and the seller's agent, in addition to the client signing it, you do not have to get that amendatory clause sign, form signed because this clause here is reiterating what that says. There's one extra step. Now, okay. again, through what I said about the VA earlier, that so what the scenario you just gave, VA, you know, the buyer says, I'll go over 20,000 over. The buyer can do that with the VA and settle and come up with the extra 20,000 cash. But they do not have to. I just want to, I did want to point, it's not that they are not allowed, but they're not forced to. Correct. Yes, they can. Yeah. Which is how uh, we've seen, and that's kind of going back to the financing point earlier, another little friendly tip. Um, if you are using a VA loan as a veteran, you should be, first of all, it's a great program, um, but you have cash to pay that appraisal gap, make sure that proof of funds is being shared to show that you have that cash. You'd be surprised how many folks are out there that see a VA loan come across and just assume they don't have any money. That's not right. the case. Can I be um, clear on something? Because now I got a little confused. On the VA loan, if they offer to go over the price and that's what we go on the contract for, you're stating that they don't really don't have to. Is that permanent in the middle of the contract while we're in the middle, while they're getting their financing and while we're under contract? Or they can change their mind? Is, is that what you're saying? No, the, the mandatory clause, the VA says that if it does not appraise, a veteran does not, cannot be forced to pay more than appraised value. They can if they want to, but they still have the right to get out if it doesn't appraise. Okay. They, yeah. So if it wasn't a VA loan, let's just say it was a conventional loan, you would be expected to adhere to the agreement as written. So you right. would be expected to come up with that appraisal gap. Mechanics lien disclosure. This is saying any mechanics liens on the property is going to be paid off at time of settlement. Kind of touched on that earlier. Non-binding mediation, which is the next page. Uh, and the miscellaneous. This is talking about if somebody is found in default or an agreement is not met, is encouraged to go to mediation first. Unless otherwise weighed by mutual agreement. A lot of legalese here. It's what most of the next paragraph is about. 
Unless otherwise provided herein, the provisions of this agreement affecting title shall be deemed merged into the deed delivered at settlement and shall not survive settlement. This is important to know because uh, we've seen a lot of questions lately when it comes to like easements and special warranty deeds and that sort of thing. When this is, those are expected to be alleviated at time of settlement. It's the same thing if there was a lien on the house or a home equity line of credit or something to that effect outside the standing mortgage. This purchase agreement is expecting that the buyer is not going to incur something else that's not already in progress. Does that make sense? Kind of a roundabout way of saying that. Seller representation, seller warrants each person signing this agreement as seller includes all persons possessing the ownership of the property. It's just disclosing that like, hey, we do in fact own this house. We do want to sell it and everybody's on the same page. This is more important when it comes to like heirs uh, or multiple persons that own a property. Electronic signatures, just what it sounds like, recognizing that you're signed, that electronic signatures are recognized in the state of Virginia, and then your delivery or your acceptance date. Questions, comments, concerns? That's the purchase agreement. Um, hey, Austin, I did have a quick question about the well and septic. Oh, yeah. Um, it is typical or it's common that the seller does still inspect well and septic. Um, in this market, we are seeing some where they're waiving it. It kind of depends. Uh, another example of, or another piece of that is if you're building a house and the house that you're building has well and septic, the seller is still usually going to pump that or inspect that well. And, um, they might not necessarily have the septic pump because it's brand new, um, but that, that is something that's still pretty, pretty standard or pretty typical for the seller to do. One thing I will awesome. say to Thank warn you, you if, if you do have the buyer inspect the septic, especially, is lots of times, especially if it's an older system, the cap gets broken or cracked or something like that while it's uh, being inspected. If the purchase is one paying for getting it inspected, then they're probably going to pay for fixing that cracked cap, where if you've got the seller doing it, then the seller's responsible. It just gets to be a excuse me, I'm putting but a pissing match, you know, over it. Um, so. It definitely does. Yeah. And kind of related to that is, uh, again, going back to the MLS, a lot of times we see language, fireplace, chimney, flu, convey as is. Uh, and you want to make sure that's disclosed in the contract. So if you're the buyer, you want to make sure your buyer is privy to that. But at the same time, that's also assuming that those inspection repairs aren't going to be asked for later because that language is there. So keep that in mind. Um, we've seen that happen before where an inspection might occur and then we get seven repairs requested and three of them are chimney related. You say cap, they may think of that. Um, same thing with well and septic. If you've taken a property as is and you do a home inspection or you do a well and septic inspection, you have that as is addendum, the buyer is expected to incur those repair costs. Right there. Okay, any other questions? We ran over a little bit longer than I wanted to, so I wanted to talk to Q&A, and I did not, but we got the call on the chat. Room. That was great. There's one in the chat, and while you're looking that up, I was just going to bring up earlier, uh, Alston brought up about, um, you know, we were talking about the loan types, and they did kind of change the rules a couple years ago. So you used to see in the MLS or advertising, no VA loans accepted or something like that. You cannot do that anymore. So, um, because that could be discrimination. Yes. The source of funds is now a uh, type of discrimination. So you can, if you want to, you can still say cash offers only because then it's against all financing, that's fine. But you can't pick a type of financing that you're not gonna accept. And that is and not the same thing as saying it may not qualify for financing. Right. So if it's um, kind of to that appraisal, Correct. Like we talked about earlier. Some loans do have stricter appraisers, meaning they're required to be a little more structurally sound than others in terms of the house um, or have certain repairs. You can't crack windows on a government backed loan, for example. Um, working heat, exactly. Exactly. So some of those who require repairs uh, may come up in an appraisal or an inspection of it too. So. But so in that instance, don't say we don't accept VA. We You could say that does not qualify for. Yeah. Probably they not qualify, qualify. Not qualify. FHA, VA financing, something like yeah. that. Um, cash or conventional offers only are encouraged. If you're, or you can say cash only, otherwise you want to say may not qualify for financing. 
You don't want to say one finance type of year. That's great. Right. Great, great. Cool. Awesome. Well, that's all I have for you guys. I appreciate you being here today. Like I said, I got most everybody's emails either from the chat or from the sign-in sheet up here, or I already know your email. And so I will be sending um, kind of survey monkey or some sort out to get feedback. Otherwise, thanks for being here. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.